as every breeder knows, technology moves very fast. Regulation, not so much. Rich Wells, I am delighted to have you here to chat with me. No, super happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So you are involved in on the regulatory side with Tropic, Mm -hmm. who uses CRISPR for some of nature's toughest crops, where diseases can be really a, a challenge and traditional breeding isn't a great solution. Can you tell me very briefly about the crops that you work most in? Yeah, of course. So, yeah, I work as part of the, the wider team that assists with the regulatory stuff at Tropic. And we work in under, under-researched tropical crops. As you say, banana is one of the main ones. And banana is a really challenging crop to innovate in because it's asexual. It doesn't breed through pollination like many other many other different crop types. And the problem there is it can never build any natural genetic diversity. The banana that we all enjoy, the Cavendish, is a cultivar that's about 50 years old. Could you imagine, you know, a 50-year-old wheat? It's impossible to, isn't it? But without gene editing, the ability to make very specific changes to the genome, you wouldn't have any variations. Conventional breeding's just not an option. So we utilize precision breeding, NGTs, to input this genetic variation to Cavendish, banana. That just couldn't happen naturally. So you're sitting right at the intersection of sort of the, the science end and then the policy or regulatory in, in your daily work. Yeah, yeah. And looking at it from, from the intellectual property side as well. And it's a really, really exciting time to be part of this sector. There's so much going on, you know, both in the UK, in the EU. It's fascinating. So can you tell me about a, a recent trait maybe that you've developed using CRISPR that and, and what you're seeing in terms of early deployment? Yeah, absolutely. So our first commercial ver- uh, variety is a reduced brown banana. So what we've done here is we've used CRISPR to incredibly specifically target a enzyme within the banana fruit flesh which is responsible for the browning reaction. So as I'm sure everyone knows, you cut a banana and after a while it goes brown. It's a lot less Not even a while, a very short amount. Very short, and we've massively extended that, which essentially opens up the fresh cut fruit market to bananas being, you know, to be, be, be part of these fruit salads that you can, can buy in the shop when you're on the go and you just need to grab something. So yeah, we'd use CRISPR to cut this gene, effectively turning it off. No other genetic modifications to the banana genome, very precise, very clean. And what we're seeing, we're seeing phenomenal results. We have a banana fruit, fruit flesh, brown so much slower, and we're excited about it. Our customers are excited about it, and we really, we really can't wait for it to get out there to the consumers. Then let me ask you on the regulation side of things. So that's the science side of things. How do you see the direction in Europe and the UK for NGTs? Let me maybe challenge you in in just a a sentence or two. What would a practical, proportionate framework look like? I think we've got to go to the heart, the philosophy of what these NGT precision breeding laws are meant to do. And that is to recognize these very precisely generated crops as conventional like that's what the science tells us the science tells us that they are conventional and so once that's been established through these new regulatory paths they should be treated as such and that means having minimal obligations to growers to you know track and trace because if they're conventional there's no real need so I think that okay. so that's what I consider as proportional, right. you know, from that from that perspective. Now, of course, there's another side, which is the consumer trust end of things. How should the the sector agriculture as a whole handle the whole concept of traceability and consumer trust for gene edited crops? What level of maybe transparency do retailers and processors really need? It's really difficult to answer that. Um, 
what we're learning from a lot of independent studies on consumer um, perception of these precision bred crops is consumers are really looking forward to getting these. You know, of course, there's some hesitancy, as there always is with any new technology. I think that's that's fair and understandable. But we think the consumers are ready for this. To your point about trust, transparency, I want to bring it back to the kind of the conventional light point. Um, hopefully, these crops are going to become more and more mainstream as these regulatory pathways open up. And so there might be hesitancy at first. But if we start treating these crops that science tells us are conventional light in a different way, it's going to be really, really difficult for them to integrate into the food system in a seamless manner. You know, if they're ingredients within a wider, you know, say an ingredient within a ready-made lasagna or something right. that's made, you know, used for the pasta, it's going to be really hard to integrate that track and trace into that, into that sort of whole food. So right. I think our view is, you know, consumers are ready for these products. Understandably, there are some concerns, but we wouldn't want the future of these products integrating into the food system to be overly hampered by too much, too right. much need for track and trace in this these, these, you know, with these early concerns. Right. Okay. So, so let's just project into the future just a little bit, say five, 10 years out. What changes are you anticipating that this technology brings to European plant breeding? I have a real hope that, you know, companies like Tropic leading the way will make this technology more mainstream. I think it's a powerful tool and it's a tool that we hope that, you know, classical breeders, all the innovators generating new varieties within the sector will embrace. And we hope that the regulatory pathways will accelerate that adoption. Ultimately, these new products, you know, we're talking about all these regulators. We said, well, how will people accept it? Until these products are out there on the market, People can't get used to them, but we think once that happens, once there's adoption, you know, in five, ten years' time, this won't be a conversation because it will just be so integrated into the tool set that breeders have that it'll just be, you know, just be one of those things in a positive way.